and welcome to another episode of We're Not Wizards. My name's Richard. I'll be your host for Jingle Bells, Jingle Bells. I know there's a week to go, but it's almost Christmas time, so something that rhymes with snow. Anyway, sounds good. <laughs> sounds absolutely brilliant. Um, <laughs> the person that's interrupted me is not even waiting to be introduced. Um, it's coming up for Christmas time. It's obviously a time that's important for both online sellers Um uh, but and you've probably heard from uh, our episode with Games Quest, um, but it's also important for uh, the retailers, the bricks and mortar retailers. So, over the next couple of weeks, we're might going to be bringing in a couple of people that sell online and sell their wares online round about the Christmas time. So, uh, joining me from the Settlers Cafe, I have got Shaz or Shaheen uh, Savanajad, and uh, hello, sir. How are you? I am good, sir. I'm good, sir. Thank you very much for having me. I really, really appreciate it. I thought it was about time. We've Obviously, we speak to creators, we speak to designers, we've spoken to artists, we've spoken to the guys that do the manufacturing, we've spoken to the guys that do the crowdfunding stuff, we speak to Kickstarter people all the time, and it's very rarely that we actually speak to people who, at the end of the day, are maybe bringing in their Kickstarter pledges or they're in contact with their local reps you know, bringing in the latest kind of hotness mm. and with it coming up to the run-up to Christmas, I thought it'd be nice to get somebody like yourself who is, I guess you could say, maybe joining the kind of, the wave of kind mm. of enjoyment of board games at the moment. But obviously you're in probably one of the toughest sides of that, which is the kind of the end, the end it's kind of retail. Uh, yeah, I, um, I, I hope to bring a slightly different perspective to things. Um uh, as a retailer, you know, but um, there's definitely things that we see on the ground that um, might differ from what you you may have heard, or my experiences might even be different to another retailer's, for example, yeah. whether we're on the ground or online. So, uh, by all means, my experiences are my own. Um, I can't speak for other retailers, but I'll certainly do my best to give. He does. Uh, he speaks for all retailers. Yeah. We're, <laughs> we're not speaking to any other retailers at all. It's if, oh, oh. if Shaz if Shaz is it's true then that's what it is. All hail oh, Shaz, power. King power. of Brick, oh, my the King of goodness. King of Bricks and Mortar, King of Bricks and Mortar. Here, how, how <laughs> shall we serve you, Lord? Oh, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera. I'm looking forward to this. I'm not there used to go. this. The reason that we do this is well, first of all, we say hello to everybody out there. Hello, everybody that's out there. The reason that we do this is because there's quite simply there's not enough podcasts out there about board games yeah. talking about guys in retail. It's Kickstarter after Kickstarter. That's all we hear. I think that's fair. Um, I think that's fair. So um, there's, I mean, sometimes you get the odd wee message from one of those kind of Kickstarter focused podcasts, but I think that's absolutely fair. Um, just. <laughs> You know, so yeah, yes, please. Let's, um, Let's have a chat. I'm happy to discuss it. Yeah, yeah. And the second reason that we're doing this is because Christmas is around the corner. I, I am on the naughty list. I am aware I'm on the naughty list. So I'm trying oh. to do that Bill Murray Scrooge type thing where I'm trying to, you know, live my life vicariously through other good people in order in the hope that I might end up on the good list. <laughs> <laughs> you may have contacted but, the wrong person. But we'll, but see, <laughs> we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. We'll see. Um, do you want to start off by telling us? I mean, how how did you get involved in the kind of depressed and printed trees? How did you get involved? Tell us a little bit about your history, because we're gonna, sure. as I say, we're gonna have a little bit. We're gonna have a look back at the, I guess, the straw of the past before we look at the wood of the present and then the bricks of the future. Um. That's a terrible three little this, pigs type reference. I was going to say the three little pigs is kicking about somewhere. <laughs> I don't know, just I don't like even wondering. Buy it. it was just a swang, a swang for a home run, and I, you know, ended up hitting a small child. So it's oh. one of these things. But how how did you get into the the hobby in the first place, Shaz? Well, let me, let me tell you a story about a big bad wolf. Um, it was <laughs> nah, I'm joking. <laughs> uh, it was <laughs> um, so little Shaz um, started gaming when he was quite young, actually. Um, so I wasn't in the country until I was five years old right. and, uh, from there we, my, sorry, my background is my father's Iranian and my mother's Scottish. So, um, oh. we lived in Sharjah, uh, in the United uh, Emirates, uh, United Arab Emirates. 
mm-hmm. and uh, all sorts of jazz. But I wasn't I wasn't gaming or anything around that time anyway. Um, and what really kind of captured my imagination when I was young was uh, my brother um, played all sorts of the MB slash uh, Games Workshop games. So we're talking Gear ah, Quest, yes. Space Crusades, etc. Yes. Um, those and the fighting fantasy books, the green, the green spined books that by Ian Livingston and and yes. Jackson, yes. and uh, so those really captured my imagination. And um, I think what really took it further for me was when I was maybe just like a teenager, and mm. I started showing those games to other people. Um, that was what really captured my imagination. Um, oh. And what took it to the next level, actually, was around the corner for me, I was blessed to have um, one of, I think, the only uh, live-action role-play props maker in the country at the time. And his kids used to run around beating each other up with uh, rubber and latex foam swords and stuff. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, from there, that just like sent me into the stratosphere. I just thought that was the coolest thing ever. And from there, I, I got exposed to LARP, uh, then backwards into tabletop uh, roleplay, so uh, D&D, then um, all sorts of other stuff. And from there, it's just kind of boomed. But I think my greatest joy um, from that was to, to just show other people games and you know see how they react to them and things. You've always been more of a kind of... I mean, I'm joked about living my life vicariously through yourself, but obviously <laughs> it sounds to me like you're somebody that, you know, the real joy for the tabletop experience comes from taking somebody through the motions 100%. and showing them how to play and then seeing them being kind of happy and understanding and grasping the rules and having that kind of eureka moment where they completely yeah. understand what they're meant to be I- doing, yeah? I think it's a shared happiness for sure, um, mm-hmm. because uh, for me, even in competitive games like card games and stuff, um, I always got very frustrated because I was in a quite a rural area um, in uh, Blackwood at the time in South Lanarkshire, and there weren't many other card gamers uh, besides maybe a small group of friends. So even playing with them, I wanted to get really good at the game, but I could never. Mm-hmm. Do, or it's different games and couldn't really do that. I couldn't never take it to the next level because the community wasn't there and the shared aspect wasn't there. So for me, um, it's, it's certainly all about that shared delivery, that, that, that um, joy together, that experience. And I think that makes sense, you know, looking back as to why now I am uh, a brick and mortar store owner. Okay. Before you jumped into kind of the bricks and mortar, were you building up quite a reasonable collection? I mean, were you already, you know, off the back of, you know, obviously playing with your brother, then playing with your friends, Mm. were you kind of down the line of kind of like amassing a decent sized kind of collection before you jumped and went, oh, I can make a business out of this? Not really. Um, To be honest, what happened was when I was young, um, we had all these collections and then, you know, the nemesis of board games came along, you know, the mother or the father trying to clear out the attic, you know, sold oh, all those games. So th- that, yeah, that happens. It's one of these things. So that kind of happened um, for the most part with all my old MB games, um, oh, like your requests and stuff. But um, I never really, I mean, I'm not a person who kind of hoards stuff. I just have never been. Um, One of the first years when the shop opened, actually, all of my amassed stuff, I gave it away to charity and we raised it for charity. Um, So really, I don't have a huge collection of my own. And to be honest, I'm quite content with that. I don't like hoarding things, if you know what I mean. Um, Which is probably quite quite strange for a gamer to hear from a gamer that Um, way. I don't know, because... (laughs) Well, I mean, to be perfectly honest, if you're doing something for a living, um, then I guess you get to sample all the delights of the cake shop kind of every day. That it's probably easier for you to... to, If you're enjoying a game because you're playing a game, I guess it would be nothing worse than going home and seeing you having 60 or 70 games on a shelf and knowing that actually you sitting down... I mean, playing them that night is probably going to be something that's not going to happen. So I, can I mean, compl- it, it depends on the game, I guess. I mean, if it's a game I'm really enjoying, I'll happily take it home with me for weeks. Mm. But the truth of the matter is, is that game shop owners, and I think I can speak for other game shop owners in this, is that the vast majority of them just don't have the time to play as many games as they'd like. Yeah. Um. Even even store owners who don't own a, div- a very highly diverse shop like mine that has a cafe and comics and stuff in it, um, I think that most game store owners just have a lot of their hands full running the business. Um, 
So for me, I don't get to play nearly as many games as I used to. But again, like I said, the, the joy for me is is sharing it rather than sitting playing it and and whooping the pants off people, you know? Although that is pretty fun too. <laughs> so, I mean, out of your collection that you've got just now, is there anything that you're absolutely adoring? That you're dressing up in lovely clothes and taking out for walks and leaving that little notes on the fridge and all those nice stuff. I tend to do that for card games. Um, I oh, was right. b- before um, Netrunner died, which I really loved. Um, before yeah. that game kind of died off, um, I, or after that rather, I really pursued and I'm still pursuing Light Seekers. Um, Light Seekers by Playfusion, <sighs> who also do Warhammer Sigmar Champions. Is and- that the Toys to Life? Kind yes, of game, but actually they're kind of they're moving away from that because they found that with Toys R Us going down the the tubes, they found the toys aren't selling as well, so they're focusing yeah, more yeah. on the card game oh, and right. and, the, and the app that they're doing, and it's just a phenomenal, phenomenal wee game. I, I cannot rate it more highly because it's such a low barrier to entry yet the the joy I get out of it, the value for money I get out of, it, out of a collector's card game is is very high. Um, because I can go home and play on my app. I can walk down the street and play on my app. I can sit and play with my friends. I can play with my partner uh, because the barrier to entry is so low that, that she will pay, even though she's not specifically a gamer. Uh, so for me, uh, card games wise, uh, I love, I absolutely adore Light Seekers. Um, board games wise, um, there's a few. There's a few I've really enjoyed. Uh, I always go back to Seasons, though. Seasons is a great wee, um, oh, yeah. wee game. And it's, what, 2014? So it's, what, like four years old, something like that, five years old? Yeah. Um, it's ancient now. <laughs> it is now, yeah, considering how many games have come out, you know? Um, but, yeah, absolutely. Um, I still go back to it because I really like drafting and I really like the, the sort of resource management of it. So, so that kind of tickles me as well, so... What do you? I mean, just going back to Lightseekers, what do you actually do in Lightseekers? Because it's like, I mean, you can say mm-hmm. it was a card game, but is it? I mean, is it close to Magic? Is it like Destiny? I mean, what kind of what kind of game are you talking about? I am actually downloading it on the Google Play Store as okay. we speak. So you should totally play it. Um, it's very, it's not alien, but it's very different to other card games, and that's one of the favorite things about it. Right. So, firstly, there is no turn the card sideways mechanic there's no tap mechanic so Mm -hmm. it's not a magic clone in that sense so that's great i love that it's got its own system involving buffs now buffs uh, are cards that stay in play and Mm -hmm. they're either permanent buffs that stay in play and do their thing or they rotate they rotate at the start of the turn and when they rotate they kick in a different effect and that creates this whole kind of chain in your head thinking right if that's going to rotate what's going to happen next turn when it rotates to its next side um so you've got all these kind of like it's almost like a clock you're you're managing different clock faces going round the cards um, oh, really? so it's it's really cool um without going into um without the cards in front of me it might be trickier to explain but essentially it takes five minutes to demo it's very quick um and it's very simple you've got a life total on your hero you're trying to reduce the other hero to zero yeah um and you've got all the usual cards, like you've got two actions in a turn, so you can either play an attack card and it does its effect immediately. You can play uh-huh. a defend card and it does its effect immediately. Um, or you can play a buff card and it kind of has this rotating effect where it applies its effects at different turns. Okay. Um, the other really cool thing about the game is that rather than start drawing a card at the start of your turn, you don't automatically draw cards. So you have to, or you can choose to not take actions in your turn. So you can take two actions in your turn, and if you choose to forgo those, you draw two cards at the end of your turn. If you only take one action in your turn, and you forgo one of your other actions, you draw yeah. one card at the end of your turn. So that way, you are choosing when when to draw. Effectively, when you need those cards, you will simply pass your turn and draw two cards, for example. So that's really nice, because um, you're not like drawing off the top and and praying and hoping it's the card you need um you're drawing the two cards and then you're sitting thinking right what am i going to do next turn which also makes the game a little bit faster there's there's um it's just speedier if you know what i mean and because you're doing a lot of the thinking in your opponent's turn 
Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so that's really nice about it as well. Um, it also plays multiplayer. You can draft it. Uh, you can do everything you could with, say, magic, pretty much. Um, I just think it's got a lot of scope, and I'm I'm all in uh, as far as Light Seekers is. Um, I'm really behind the Play Fusion as a company because what everything they've done so far is amazing, and yeah. uh, also just the game. The game's phenomenal. It seems interesting that it's one of these things I think that slipped by the wayside, and I think it slipped by the wayside because it was originally a toys to life kind of model and I remember mm-hmm. seeing it. I do I remember seeing it. I think um, actually um friend of the show, uh Vader Van Oden did mm-hmm. a series with his son where they played kind of light seekers and they were very much sure. kinda they do a lot of toy toys and games kind of stuff and I remember mm-hmm. seeing that and going, that was really, really interesting. I remember him talking about it. Um they're talking about was it the R Wing game, which is another oh, Toys right. to Life game, but I think the same mm-hmm. the same I think the as you as you rightly said, with things like Toys R Us kind of failing, um, and kids aren't able to get their hands and demonstrate and actually see something in action, sometimes I mean it just it just kind of disappears. So I'm going to try this game, yeah. and I technically have your address, so I know where you live. So if it's not great, <laughs> you can always yeah, you can just like send me letters and stuff. Come, yeah, I'm going to come around the cafe. Uh, <laughs> But in, in all, all seriousness, though, um, with regards like a brief history of Light Seekers is really is fascinating because unlike other card games as well, it didn't just like explode onto the scene. Most card games they have this big release and then it dies off. Light Seekers, like you say, I mean it's been tied to the toys, but also yeah, there's it's kind of it's always hummed under the radar slightly, and I. I'm just going to give it time because I think, like I say, I think it's a great product and I think it will explode at some point pretty yeah. soon. Pretty soon, I reckon. Maybe once they've had a wee bit more exposure from the sister game, Warhammer uh, Age of Sigmar Champions. Yeah, because I saw that. And is that not share kind of similar mechanics in terms of the rotating cards? Yes. And the kind of the mechanism from there? Because when you said that, I said, what was it? John and Simon were playing something the other day. Mm. I think it was it was a good four or five weeks, and it was the release of that. They had the big, huge box yes. that they had bought with a multitude of cards, and they were just explaining. And they said, "Yeah, yeah, but you just rotate the card, and then it gets you a different power, and then it's yeah. brilliant and fantastic." And it's like I'm wondering <laughs> if it's going to be a case that, well, you know how Pokemon mm. is sometimes connected to magic, and people say, "Well, a lot of people Definitely. play." Pokemon first and then they move to magic and then or Definitely. people sometimes play Pokemon as a kind of a lighter version of magic when they're playing with their kids. Yes. yes. Um I'm wondering if that is going to be the same with, you know, light seekers of people that are playing the kind of the Age of Sigmar champions are gonna say, Well, I can actually play light seekers and it's very mm-hmm. in a very, very kind of kind of similar vein. I um, hope so. Um they, yeah. they are similar, definitely. But sorry, go ahead. No, no. I mean, you sound like not a champion of Sigma, but a champion of Light Seekers. <laughs> oh, definitely, definitely. Um, I mean, we stock Sigma. We like Sigma. It's good. Um, yeah. If I, uh, one of the things I don't stock in my store is miniatures games. So if I, if I stocked more Games Workshop stuff, I'm sure I would love Sigma. Um, yeah. But for me, Light Seekers was baby number one. I mean, when it came out, it came out at UK Games Expo, uh, not this year, but the, the year prior, 2017. And mm-hmm. when it came out. I was just flabbergasted, fascinated with the game, and two weeks later they released it uh, very quietly to one of my suppliers, and I just went all in on it. And <laughs> from then, after I went all in on it, I told all the other store owners I know. I said to them, "Guys, you need to be stocking this game." Uh, and then, uh, thankfully, with a wee bit of persuasion from me and PlayFusion, they all tried it out and stuff, and some of them are still pushing it and stuff. So, um, yeah, definitely, I'm very much a champion for Light Seekers. So you can play you can play the card as you can play the card alongside the app at the same time, then, or is the app you, kind of supplement mm, or is the app a separate entity altogether? It's more just a separate way to play. So right. you can it kind of like Pokemon. Pokemon has the card game and it has mm-hmm. the mm-hmm. the app online where you can play Pokemon. Mm. Yeah. Um, um, it's exactly the same. Um, you scan the, the the key difference though is that you, with your physical cards you've got and you've bought, yeah. you get e- extra value at those because you can scan them into your app and use them. Whereas in Pokemon, you would need a separate like booster yeah. little yeah. thing card in the booster Code. to scan. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's nothing wrong with that, but I think the fact that you're getting double duty out of Light Seekers is just very clever. 
Yeah, and I continually see the argument about um, tying in kind of board games or the analog experience into the digital experience, and how sure you know you get board games that use apps, and you get board games that become come apps, and it's like kind of guess kind of marrying the two together, so you can kind of like it's worthwhile purchasing, it's worthwhile purchasing the card game if you've got the app because the having the cards themselves is going to kind of kind of add value, exactly, which is, which is kind of cool. How I mean, for yourself, what was the moment where you said, "Right, I'm getting all this stuff. I need an idea." I take it you kind of were working your working yourself silly in a job, job, mm-hmm. and then at some point, or you went and studied, and then at some point you went actually, "What's my way forward? What's my direction?" And then I take it settlers kind of came off the back of that. I mean, what was the story behind actually so, to where you are today? There's a lot of different factors going on there, actually. Bear, bear with me, because it's a bit of a story, but I think it's interesting, because my story is slightly it's similar, but it's slightly different to a lot of other game store owner stories. Um, my story um, for game shop ownership really starts in 2012. Um, what happened was I was an ESOL teacher in Japan for two years, and right. I, came, I came back from Japan um, to this country. And, of course, no one really needs an ESOL teacher. Um, no, uh, Just for reference, an ESOL teacher being someone who teaches English as a foreign language yeah. in that country. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. English speakers don't need, need an English teacher. So uh, I tried to You'd pursue that. You'd be surprised, that... though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've, yeah, actually, now I think about it. Um, no, definitely. I mean, <laughs> this, so, probably maybe it's another shop, idea. So. Um, don't say that <laughs> no no I shouldn't um, but no I'm only joking um, but with regards to um, to that uh, when when I opened the store uh, I opened in 2014 and yeah. that was after coming back in 2012 um, trying different things I tried the ESOL cure elsewhere I tried um, working um, in different jobs also uh, different um, game shops in some cases I've had uh, very different um, you know different jobs uh, throughout and at the same time while I was kind of looking for different jobs trying different jobs I, I to keep myself motivated what I did is um, I really wanted to push tabletop gaming forward because when I came back from Japan I found that despite Big Bang Theory being big despite all these other huge factors being big you know Marvel movies and stuff um, game shops and games clubs and stuff were just kind of they just weren't there from what I saw no. um, so at the time anyway right back in 2012 so what I did is I just created a very simple Facebook group and said to people you know hey guys um i'm literally going to go do a tour of as many game shop groups and game shops and stuff that i can find and i'm going to talk to you and if i can get you on facebook and actually advertising yourself to other like-minded people um maybe that will help grow each other and yeah. so that's why I did. I did i did that until about 2013 and we noticed like that people were starting to talk to each other a lot of people used to a lot of groups and stuff used to just be on yahoo groups and things like that or forums and that just wasn't it wasn't out there, it wasn't mainstream, it wasn't adequate in my eyes. Um, and eventually what that led to was there was no games club in South Lanarkshire, so that led to me forming Lanarkshire Gamers. Um, so when I formed Lanarkshire Gamers back, I want to say 2013, um, I think six of us showed up, and then very quickly six became nine, and then 15, and then 20, and then 40. Um, so games cl- the game club thing just exploded. Lanarkshire Gamers became huge very quick. So to the point where we created a second club, and then that second yeah. club created a third club um, for all sorts of reasons. It became a netrunner club, you know? So there was all these crazy things going on with gaming. And then I realized to myself, well, this is something I'm passionate about. And yeah. my current career isn't working. I might as well, if I really believe in growing gaming, rather than just being a gamer selling to other gamers, I said to myself, I'm going to have to plant a flag in South Lanarkshire and go, non-gamers, come here, come here and play. And yeah. that's what led to the birth of Settlers. What led to the naming of it? Because everybody that's going to be saying the word Settlers is going to be going, oh, good on. Yeah. And it's going to say, bless you. What did yeah. you say your name was? Settlers. Oh, good oh, good um, Excuse yeah. me. No, that's cool. I think um, actually there's three main reasons why we call the shop settlers or why I call the shop settlers. Um, the first one is the definite obvious homage to Settlers of Catan. Um, and we yeah. wanted we wanted to give settlers its respect 
effect in its due. Settlers was one of the first sort of light Euro games or lighter strategy games that came across the pond or came across to us and um, just really uh, got people into gaming. So Settlers is due that respect. We we all all hail Settlers, um, off Catan, and uh, <laughs> all hail, uh, all hail. Uh, but then there were two other main reasons. Um, one was that Settlers is an idea I want for the shop. Um, I want people who aren't necessarily gamers, visitors, explorers, whatever you want to call them, people who pop in off the street who have no idea what this stuff is, but I want yeah. them to, to come in and form a community. I want them to settle in a place on one of our tables and have fun and meet new people who are friendly because they're all there for the same purpose. They all want a game or they all want to get into comics. So they all want to just chill out and have a good time. Um, so that was the kind of second reason, and the third reason, as as a which ties in uh, nicely from what I said earlier about my personal life, was that my personal life wasn't settled. I, I had no career at that time. I had nothing really pushing me forward. So for me, it was kind of a, a dream on my part that I I want to settle. I wanted to settle at the time, and I wanted to settle down. And and thankfully, for almost five years on now, now that we've been in the business, um, I, I can say that you know we're doing okay, and I. I feel a lot more settled in my career um and i you know a little plug for the shop i want to keep it growing and, and going strong so yeah that's cool i also realize it's a 1980s kind of indigestion tablet as well so i was wondering <laughs> if you ever got the co- confusion of people going in coming and going oh my stomach's just you know what i mean if it's not one stomach. end it's the other and i was just wondering i heard this is a good place where you can settle our stomach and you go katan sir Big party. Just... <laughs> um, um, exactly. Well, we still coffees, madam. Um, no, uh, no, absolutely. Uh, we we um we've had that once actually, um, <laughs> and a, we had that. it once. And <laughs> what happens is when you're in business, when you're in business and you're you're writing business plans for people, yeah. and you're showing them to people and trying to get funding and all sorts and all this jazz and convince people that it's a it's a gore of an idea. Um, what you tend to find is people ask you all sorts of weird questions, and. They say, settlers, see for your brand. Is that not going to get confused with like Wendy's and stuff like that? <laughs> and and I had to answer that question. I'm sitting there like, well, I hear what you're saying, but this is what it actually means, <laughs> you know. Uh-huh. And That's I amazing. would give them the the explanation that I just kind of gave you, and just say, you know, this is what it means to us as a store. Um, but it, thankfully, it's only ever been confused that one time. Thankfully, when you, I mean, when you're going for like. Um, Kind of, I guess, kind of funding and assistance and stuff like that. Um, was it difficult to kind of persuade the kind of the vision? I mean, I don't know how you got mm. set up. If you got through private funding or if you went through kind of finance options or stuff like that. But yeah. was it because it would have been quite? I mean, I mean, it would have been unusual in twenty twelve, let alone yeah. you know nowadays. Yeah. I mean, was it a difficult thing to kind of sell? I take it, you know, small business advisors and everybody like that would have been what, like Monopoly. Exactly. Been, exactly. <laughs> That's exactly what question. they did. That's exactly what they did. Um they, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um so you <laughs> would um so for example, what would happen is firstly you have to go in with some of your own money if you want any funding. I mean no one's gonna fund you if you're not willing to put yeah. some of your own money in. So once you get that out of the way and then you start getting those creeping questions like, so board games, do you mean my Monopoly? <laughs> and that's ex- exactly what they would say. And you'd be like, yes, but also this, but also that. <laughs> Have you heard of Dungeons and Dragons, sir? Do you know what a games workshop is? You know, and then they would go, oh, yeah, do you play Blood Bowl? And you'd be like, yeah, I totally play Blood Bowl. And then that would really, you know, people would start... Yeah you know um wiring the neurons and they'd start getting things a wee bit more um because you know to be fair well i wouldn't say my shop is all about monopoly we certainly have it in the games like archive for people to play if that's what they want to do um it's it's there it's an option it's not a game i'd necessarily recommend um but it's there if you want it you know um and as I say, you know, we are there to cater to anyone who wants to come in and try this thing, this sort of stuff. So that's definitely part and parcel of that. But with regards to convincing people and talking to people who don't know what it's about, um, yeah. uh, one quick story we had was there was a chat for the council. Where I was talking about um, renting a unit because the council, the, where we are, it's in a... Um, like a... What do you call it? I don't even remember what it's called now. It's like a... a, a 
a sort of safe zone, a council zone, where a regeneration area. That's where I'm. Yeah. Going. And yeah. uh, the council take charge of that. And so as a result, to work with him, you go in, you, you talk to someone for the council and um, the chap who's on a project team for that was like, okay, I don't know anything about this, but it sounds really interesting and I can clearly see you're very passionate. Let me get my friend who actually knows about this stuff and we're going to come and have a sit down and talk about it. So right. four meetings later with this chap and his friend, they went, oh, yeah, it's totally, it's, it's a geek shop. Yeah, go for it. You know, and that, that was all, all he needed to go, like, rubber stamp what we needed to do. Um, yeah. Once he knew it, it was like, oh, yeah, Game of Thrones is really big right now. Yeah, yeah, totally. This is a gore. Go for it. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> once <laughs> once we had that, he, he had, like, his friend confirm to him um, what, what we were. He was like, you know what? I don't get this stuff. I go mountain climbing at the weekends. But you know what? I'll give it a try. And that was all it took, um, at least for that side of things to kind of progress. There were other issues, obviously, yeah. but that's, that's, I mean, that's, yeah, I mean, that's the, the kind of general sort of level of expectation you can, you can expect when, um, you are trying to change and, and give exposure to something that is relatively unknown. When, I mean, you've got the cafe up and running, okay? Is, mm-hmm. uh, um, is it difficult to keep a balance between? Because one of one of the things I see again and again and again, and I usually see them within kind of board game groups on Facebook, is that mm-hmm. you know I went into a friendly local game shop the other day, and they were anything but friendly. They chased me uh. out the door with their dog, and they threw things at me, <laughs> and you know what I mean. And they put a banana spiel in my way so that when I tried to go out the door, I slipped upon my bum bum. <laughs> And I cried to mummy on the way home. And there's this kind of like this demonization. I mean, I've seen, um, you know, I have seen this a few times of folks saying, well, I'm going to go and buy from, you know, the big river in the jungle because, you know, I prefer to shop there kind of thing as opposed to going and seeing this person. I I went in there the other day and they were like burning somebody at the cross, for goodness sake, (laughs) kind of thing. And then I'm just thinking, well, you've kind of got that, but Mm. did you have to balance up kind of being a retail outlet with being mm. the cafe because one of the things i do see about the retail the friendly local game mm. store is it's a place where people store games it's like a bookshop the guy mm. that owns the bookshop doesn't want to sell you the books because that's where he keeps his collection no. kind of thing but that's... i mean were you i mean are you try were you try was it difficult to kind of get a balance between making sure you're retailing to people and making mm. sure that you're kind of you know not just having people come in and just hang around and not spend yeah. any money. There's there's a couple of really good questions in there because there's there's a discussion about diversity there. About um, I'll explain what I mean in a wee second, but there's also um, that whole customer service thing going on. Um, so the customer service side of things, I, I totally understand. Um, for some people, certainly some people are online shoppers that that's what they want they want it at the cheapest price for whatever reason that's totally fine i get that maybe we don't we as the the friendly local game store don't necessarily fulfill their needs and Mm -hmm. then they go and they get really angry um expecting to have their needs fulfilled and they go well i can just get it cheaper elsewhere and they go on a big rant where and, and that's fine they can customers can do that that's fine it's customers know their needs you know better than i could ever hope to the thing is sometimes customers think that um their needs are tied to a certain shop because maybe they've heard how great and cool friend the local game stores are but in actual fact they're probably more of an online shopper so that's i mean that's just a part and parcel of resale you know you're not going to satisfy every customer unfortunately as much as we'd love to um some people just have needs that maybe they thought we could satisfy but it wasn't there. That's just one of those things yeah. for, for any yeah. FLGS, I think, um, or for any retailer for that matter. Well, there's a games workshop kind of style of selling, and I'll, I'll always, mm-hmm. I'll never understand that until kind of now when I'm facing it. We used to go, I used to hate going to games workshop. Games workshop, I hated yeah. going into you. I just didn't what? like stepping inside because Why? I'd be going in. And I'd be saying, right, okay, there's there's advanced hero quest, and oh look, there's an expansion for normal yeah. hero quest, and. Yeah. And then you'd get a gig, somebody coming up to you and being friendly. <laughs> How dare they? How dare they be friendly? I didn't get... Well, I'm a, I'm a guy, <laughs> right? I'll tell you what, if I'm going in and I'm buying shoes, right, I'm going in and mm. I'm going, right, you got these you got these in a 10, mm. and they'll bring them out in a 10, and then I'll try them on, 
and if they're fine and if they're not more than say 60 quid then you've got a deal there you go money's gone I was into this environment where people wanted to have discussions and people wanted to find out more about what I was wanting to do and I wasn't sure about that that was very kind of alien looking back now I could see it was like Games Workshop themselves were probably an awful lot ahead of their time. They were using mm. what you would call nowadays a consultative approach to selling. They're and trying. They're almost. They're almost selling to you like like you were walking in to buy a car. You were getting the same yes. kind of sales yeah. guy. Kind of how you doing? What you're going to be using this for? Is it Definitely. for practical? Are you thinking of storming the Citadel? You know, do you prefer yeah. to use the Scout thing? Are you more an Ultramarine? You look a little uh. bit like a Blood Angel to me. All hail the Emperor, <laughs> nerd, ten thousand years kind of thing. But I look at it now, and this is, you know, at the time I was like, people used to take the Michael out of Games Workshop folk mm. because they were very passionate, but they were just trying to be friendly. And now I look back on it, and I'm just what I say, you know, sorry, Gavin. <laughs> Mm. You know, for, you've, being you've a touched, bit of, for being a bit you've, abrupt for you, <laughs> you've you've, t- you've touched on a lot of really good points there. Um, I think what Games Workshop's approach there is is really they've recognised that they are a specialty retailer, as are we, and they've recognised that because they're a specialty re- retailer, they need to give that specialty service and narrow things down and make sure the customer gets exactly what they want. Yeah. Um, whereas compare that to nowadays, where a lot of times you go into a shop and you get either self service, no service, or really poor service so really i mean a lot of shops nowadays you won't be spoken to you walk into and you're expected to kind of choose things on your own and there's nothing wrong with that i guess because you know the internet's kind of taught us to be self-sustainable that way but that's the opposite of what a lot of people expect and people don't often realize they think they're walking into a retail shop but actually when you walk into one of a shop like mine you're walking into a specialty retail shop that's got lots of it's an aladdin's cave with lots of answers and cool things that you can find so there's there's that factor going on as well but with regards to games workshop um bearing in mind games workshop also went through a lot of different stages in their history so for example they had the red stage where everything was energy energy go 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 blood angels paint it red red ones go faster red (laughs) dice red dice so (laughs) games workshop had that phase you know um whereas now we're in the warhammer phase where everything's a warhammer shop and they've rebranded very cleverly Uh, yeah. it's all kind of dark and it's a bit you know it's all like so you left somebody's tell gavin to put the lights on will you can't yeah. see a thing <laughs> yeah <laughs> the goth phase no um no i know to be fair i think that's a very clever move in games workshops part they've set themselves aside from comic shops game shops and they've, they're using they're leveraging their intellectual property as the warhammer store that yeah. people mums and dads refer to them um as the warhammer store you know so i think that's actually a very clever move in their part but um <sighs> Yeah, sorry. You, you. There was another point you mentioned that was really good, and I wanted to touch on it. Um, it was about uh, I can't remember. Sorry, it's escaped me. <laughs> but you are you offering? Some, you are you some... trying to offer an experience? Then is this what you're trying to do? You're not trying to offer kind of like retail. Are you trying to go in with people and offer them an experience so that when they step in the door through settlers, mm-hmm. they're not really feeling like they're being kind of sold to they're settling in they're trying a game and at the end of it then they might just turn around and say mm-hmm. kind of it because this is what people are talking about it's like well this, this mm-hmm. is why people are saying that friendly local game stores maybe aren't doing as well as they are because there is the guy around the counter and there's not the interactivity mm-hmm. are you almost kind of like ushering people in as kind of like i've never played a card game before to ushering yeah. people out with like a couple of a core deck and a couple of boosters and they're happy to give you the money because you've sat down and spent half an hour with them showing them how it actually works and how they actually get things going and they've had a cup of tea at the same time I think so, but I mean, there's there's a lot of again, there's a lot of really good. See, none of my answers are going to be straightforward, which is probably good. Um, but I mean, with regards to experience selling, yes, one hundred percent. Um, we, I mean. If you're competing with online, for example, the the Great River in the Sky we talked about earlier with the jungle, um, those guys are cheaper for a number of reasons. And anyone who's not in that bracket is not going to compete on price. Yeah. So in a pure brass tax sense, in a pure business sense, it does not make sense for us to try to compete on price. So we have to offer something else. There we have we need to have a reason for existence. Otherwise, you know, why why are we doing this? So for me, our reason of existence, uh, settlers' reasons of existence certainly, um, is 
to offer an experience, not only for me anyway, to offer an experience to everyone. Whereas some local game stores are more um, specialized, so they're, they're even more looking to offer the experience to people who already know this kind of stuff. And that's just something other local game stores might you know take a stand on that's up to them how they want to do things but for settlers certainly it's to be able to show people the way but also you know to show them the way and give them a community if that's what they want um it's also to make sure that they're being pointed in the right direction so rather than Mm -hmm. you know running up to one of my staff for example or myself would rather than running up to you um as you enter the door and going red ones go faster buy red dice um you know rather than doing that kind of stuff um (laughs) which isn't true of games workshop to be fair you know that's just that was a phase Um, i think they've done extraordinarily well for where they are because the fact is like looks i'm talking about you know i'm talking about 25 years ago about a a yes. retail outlet that's still going. Yes. So you, you know what, whatever you say about them, however you slag them off, exactly. whatever, whatever gripes you have about them, they're still there. They're still trading. They're like exactly. Madonna. They keep inventing themselves. They've exactly. maybe had a couple of dodgy albums. They had that animated video <laughs> thing that didn't go down that quite well. But we're still there. They've maybe not been pulled down down the stairs by a cape. Exactly. But you exactly. Know, but you no, know, no, I, I they're totally still, agree. They're still thriving, you know. I totally agree. And although we might make jokes and stuff about them, I'd like to think they're they're done with a wee bit of love and care because at the end of the day, a lot of us grew up with Games Workshop, you know. But I don't want a single Games Workshop out. I just use that as an example because I think at least my staff are trained to basically wait yeah so you say hello everyone gets a hello if they don't my staff have done something wrong yeah and then essentially once everyone gets a hello what we expect is either the customer will kind of guide us to what they want so the customer will stand in a certain area of the shop maybe they'll stand next to the comic books maybe they'll come straight up to the till and ask for a demonstration maybe they'll want a coffee maybe Mm -hmm. they'll walk up to the games have a browse at the games and then that's the point where we'll be able to go up and talk to them and say, hey, how you doing? Um, if you need a hand, give me a shout. And if they want to elaborate, they can elaborate. If they don't want to talk to us, no no, no harm, no foul. I'll go, I mean, I'm a busy man. I'll go find out something else to do. That's no problem. But as long as we are there for the customer and we are able to, to help them, um, because like we say, that there's such a specialized need. There's so many different things that I sell now that um, there's no possible way I could read your mind and anticipate that, that you're going to walk into my shop and want X, Y, or Z. Um, yeah. There's there's so many things that I can offer um, someone, especially since I'm, we're trying to, to give an experience. Um, there's so many ways to give different people an experience. Um, and if anything, actually, I think um, there's more pitfalls to that that over diversification you know where you have too many things going on um, and yeah. there's, there, there's actually pitfalls to that so that's something that um if any other flgs owners or, or, or people who have an interest in, in opening a store like that um have questions about I, I would i would just warn them not to over diversify and diversify is, is certainly a, a hot diversification is certainly a hot topic amongst the uh, flgs owners at the moment um there's there's a lot going on there for a number of reasons well, I mean, we've had, um, you know, we've had, we've spoken to Games Quest a couple of times and they are quite open in saying that, you know, entering the retail market and the board games is just, it's such a, it's a bloody battlefield that for sure, unless for sure. you're willing to kind of make minimum margin on it, it's a really, really difficult thing to do. And the fact is that, you know, um, and that interview will be out, um, is that you know Nigel himself? They are opening up their own board game cafes because they've seen the value in offering an experience Definitely. that does end up in a kind of a kind of a you know a kind of a transaction, mm. which is you know which is which is the, where it is. There's a um, couple of good books actually. I'd like to recommend at this point. If, if one, mm. if you're thinking about opening a game shop, there's a book by a very experienced retailer, 14, 15 years in the game. His name is Gary Ray. He runs a store called Black Diamond Games in Sacramento um, or California. I think it's Sacramento, and he um, runs. He has a book called FLGS, Friendly Local Game Store, um, how to make a middle class income. Yeah, which is 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 exactly exactly as low key as you might think it should be, because that is exactly what being an FLGS owner is. The, it's not you're not selling the dream. You're not having this massive multi million empire. You're you're there to make a middle class income and enjoy your life. And so that's a really, really good book for anyone who's interested about why the game trade is tricky and why Mm -hmm. um, 
it costs much. Um, a quick anecdote from that book, for example, is the re- the return on investment for for retail is really quite low for um for a retail owner, um particularly for tabletop games. So that's one factor that leads into that. Without getting into the whole book, yeah. Um, the second book I'd like to recommend is because we've discussed experience in such a really key way. I'd really like to yeah. recommend a book that's nothing to do with tabletop games. It's called the the Experience Economy. And All right. In that book, it lays out a few. Basically, the first chapter is all you need to read because the rest of the book is just him filling out the book with examples of his theory. And yeah. the theory is, uh, it's like a four-tiered graph, uh, a line graph. And the first tier is commodity. If you're selling a commodity, it's very cheap and, and low end, and uh, you don't need to command a huge price for a commodity, so you can sell them cheap. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. In my eyes, games are not a commodity goods, but for some customers they are, so they want them cheap. Yeah. Um, the next stage would be like a service level, so you're expecting good service, but there's more effort in that service. So because there's more effort in that service, you can command more of a price. So the theory goes. Um, the third level always escapes me, but the fourth level, the one I'm interested in, is the experience level. So let's say I go to Alton Towers and I go with my kids. I don't have any, but let's say I go with my, my imaginary kids and they um they ride the nemesis or whatever cool that'd be so funny you go to the rides <laughs> you just like <laughs> empty stuff just uh, you just like seats go there they go do you mind that one's taken yeah. it and i paid for it thanks very much <laughs> and it's just a photo of me with my thumbs up um <laughs> so, so you'd imagine the arm around someday <laughs> This is my beautiful invisible wife. Um, so. so, so that, but what they do on Terrace, for example, is that they, or any of these other kind of uh, roller coaster type places, is that they're able to command, let's say, ten pound for a photograph. Now, why is someone going to pay ten pound for a photograph? Well, they're going to do it as a memento of their experience. Yes. So, yes. what we are in the business of is creating experiences and trying to leverage, you know, a, a price for that. Let's be brutally honest. You know, I'm, I want to get paid. So. Um, yeah. How do I create um, a memento of their experience? One of the disconnects, I believe, anyway, at least in our industry, is that a lot of us are trying to create a memento of the experience with a commodity good. For example, a booster pack of magic. So, yeah. you know, I am creating these great experiences, but I'm only getting paid a commodity good price. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. But that is a whole other discussion. But essentially, those two books are really, really good starting points for any retailer um, who's looking to get into the FLGS market. Um, but seriously, if anyone's listening and uh, they are interested in becoming a friend of the local game shop of any sort of description, please get in touch. Talk to me. I'm happy to, to give you as little or as much advice as I can give you. Um, I'm I'm only four years in the game, so I'm not a giant yet, but there are yeah. people I know who have been in the, the, the game for like 30, 40 years, and I can maybe get some advice from them to pass on to you. Are you doing online, or is online something that you would consider dabbling in but would never kind of want to do? That's a very timely question. Um, I've been in the, the game four years, and I haven't done it online yet. However, right. um, now, basically, what I did literally this month is I completed my store, as it were. Um, so I got I hit level four, and I've, I've completed my store. My store is full. I cannot add anything more to my store. And yeah. what I would like to do now is, in between creating robust systems and using technology to do things, uh, next year, I, I think you can safely expect, either next year or the year later, um, a, an online website from us. Awesome. Awesome. Um, if people want to find you, not only on the internet webs, but also if they're playing a bit of Pokemon Go, mm-hmm. And they're st- stotting about, <laughs> stotting about Lanarkshire. Sure. Where where can we find you? Not only on the internet webs, but on the on on the wide on the wide web of world. The wide web of world. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's like the invisible partner in the roller coaster. Um, Something like. So, <laughs> so um, uh, on the internet, we are strictly focused on Facebook at the moment, and the reason yes. for that is is purely um, because we can organise events there very very well. Um, yeah. so again tying back into that experience of event running so we're on Facebook we are Settlers Hamilton on Facebook uh, please check us out 
um, see what you think, check out our photos and stuff, see if you think it's it's for you. Um, by all means, get in touch if there's anything you, you'd you like to point out, or even just you know get in touch to say hello. Um, so there's that on Facebook. Um, we are also on Twitter, but we don't really have a huge presence there. We are also on Instagram. Um, loads of pictures, including pictures of my dog are on there. Um, we also have uh, on so that's Facebook and, and online and all that jazz. We're on the, all the social media pretty much. Um, with regards to our physical presence, we are in Hamilton, South Lanarkshire. Um, if you want to check out the postcode, our postcode is ML36BU. But alternatively, um, if you just want to get to us and pop in, uh, go to Hamilton Central train station, get off there, walk down the road for maybe five minutes, and you'll see us um, on the way towards Asda in Hamilton. We're very close to Asda in Hamilton. Um, awesome. If you're if you're on Pokemon Go. Just hit all the Pokestops. We're on a really good Pokemon Go route, actually. I play Pokemon Go myself, so... Um, <laughs> there you go. So if you want to talk about Pokemon Go, just drop us a line. Feel free. Excellent, excellent. Um, and what we'll do is we'll make sure we put all of those uh, links and that address kind of like in the show notes so that oh, we have you. notes to show. Um, I've got one more question for you. Mm-hmm. Um, an evil... <laughs> Local Emporium oh. has set up shop some five minutes down the road from you. Dun, dun, dun. They have a twi- they have a twiddly moustache. There is an evil glint in their eye. Unfortunately, they're not very very careful with um, you know they smoke an evil evil cigar. <laughs> so at the end of the night, one night they were smoking their evil cigar and they're ha 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 and swishing their cape <laughs> and they flick it behind them and it lands inside their sh- inside their shop. Oh. Unfortunately, sticking something flammable into a place full of cardboard is only naturally going to cause one certain event, which is the shop starts to go on fire, okay? That's terrible. Because it's an evil, dastardly organisation, it actually has managed to amass a board game collection of some volume with yeah. first editions, second editions, anything at all. You have the ability to rush in because there's a sprinkler system the place isn't going to burn to the ground however the sprinkler system's probably going to activate in about three minutes and that means the entire collection is going to get soaked Mm. Shaz you have the choice to go in and rescue three board games or card games Mm. or anything to do with tabletop what are the three things that you go in and rescue it can be anything at all oh that's so tricky um Oh, that's so tricky. Uh, I would... Oh, well, I'd probably pick up his top hat first because um, that's important. Top hats are cool. Uh, then I would... Let me think. What would I pick up? If there was a magic binder in there, there's a strong chance I would pick up a magic binder in there. Um, mostly just to give it back to him. You know, there's that would be so sad losing your magic collection. Um and out of nostalgia, I would probably grab the old MB games like Hero Quest and uh, Space Crusade and stuff like that, um, just because they're an absolute nightmare to get nowadays. Okay. So magic, mm. Hero Quest and Space Crusade. Magic, particularly because there's probably a lot of value in there, but also like okay. you know, people have memories of those things, and it might be evil, but no one wants to wish that on an evil competitor burning down their magic collection. That's rough. <laughs> it's so it's such a typical answer I would expect from you after knowing you for like all of a couple of hours <laughs> that you would be that lovely and that generous about you know the evil man who's planning to dominate your destiny but you know you, well, of course you're going to answer like that you know no you know way. if he's if he's if he's not if he's not done it within five minutes and destroyed me, then chances are I'm going to stick around. So, exactly. you know, you know, he can try his best, but I'll, I'll not take his magic collection from him. That's rough. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, this has been an absolute pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you, thank you like, very, very likewise, much. For... Thank you. Um, your questions have been phenomenal. Um, also, I'd just like to point out, um, if you do have any more really more of your insightful questions, um, they have been very, very helpful because I could have went on a lot longer answering them. <laughs> uh, honestly, honestly, um, please let me know. Um, it's been a pleasure. <laughs> There's only um, there is only two more things to do. Okay. Um, but there's actually three more things to do. I've got to tell people where they can find us. You know where to find us. We didn't have a place of bricks and mortar. 
unlike the wonderful Shaz here. But however, if you go onto Twitter, if you go onto Instagram, if you go onto Facebook, you search for We're Not Wizards, thou shall find us. If you want to find our website, we're not wizards.com. If you want to find our blog, it's we're not wizards.blogspot.com. If you want to find us across the various podcast catchers, you can do so. Thou shall find us on Spotify and Stitcher and Spreaker and Acast and Podknife and Podbean itself. Podbean are fantastic. They put automatically put our shows onto YouTube so people can listen to us on YouTube, which is just a strange concept, but that's fine. Um, if you like us an awful lot, then please consider jumping on to Apple Podcasts and dropping us a rating or a review and a subscription. And as we say, if you are going to be giving us a, um, a rating or a review, don't give us 10 stars because it makes us big headed. <laughs> but don't give us one star because it makes us cry. Give us something in the middle, like a five, because it's average. And we, we're just a little bit average. Aim for the mediocrity. <laughs> Aim for mediocrity. Every single time, you know what I mean? There's a, what's the point? If you aim for the moon and if you hit the moon, you're going to die because you've not got a space to <laughs> on. <laughs> well, that's, that's, I mean, that's why I'm a, an FLGS owner. We, we all aim for mediocrity. I mean, that's, that's what it is. So aim for the middle, guys. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. That's it. But um, <laughs> but the one person who's not been average is the wonderful, the rather fantastic, <laughs> the very overly friendly, <laughs> extremely helpful, extremely happy Janet Jackson. Shaz <laughs> Janet Jackson. <laughs> um, thank you, Richard. Thank you, very, No, thank you. Been, thank you very, very much for coming. There's only, as I say, there's only two more things to do. The first thing is to remember that we are many things, but we're not wizards. Are we wizards, Shaz? <laughs> nah. Nah. And the second thing is to say goodbye. So it's as goodbye from Shaheen. Say goodbye. Bye. It's a goodbye from me. Remember, stay safe, roll sixes, and if you fancy get in out and about and you're in Hamilton and you're saying it must nip down to Asda because um, I need to get myself some tea bags, <laughs> um, don't bother. Don't bother <laughs> getting your tea bags. Go you know, get out of the train station, you know, go to Settlers and they get your tea for you, but you can also, like, maybe play a game, play something <laughs> that you've not played before, make some new friends. You know, it's fantastic. But until the next time, goodbye. <laughs>